segment, I will now talk about building a livable and enduring home by safeguarding public health and sustaining our hawker culture. I will start with public health. COVID-19 has underscored the importance of personal and public hygiene. Last year, we launched the SG Clean movement to urgently shore up our public health defences. Practices like hand washing have become the norm. Over 30,000 premises have achieved the SG Clean quality mark. We passed the Environmental Public Health Amendment Bill to introduce mandatory baseline environmental sanitation standards. But the battle is far from over. Gastroenteritis incidents affected more than 1,200 persons in 2018 and 2019. Such cases persist. Satisfaction levels of public cleanliness at premises like markets, hawker centres and coffee shops remain low. On average, only 30% of patrons return their trays. Birds which are attracted by food remnants continue to be a nuisance with about 90 feedback cases on this every month. We need to do more. But it is not prudent to rely solely on scarce public resources, whether for cleaning, surveillance or enforcement. A lasting solution requires everyone to play their part. For example, on littering, which Mr Lim Biao Chuan raised, we have increased fines, deployed camera surveillance and reviewed the corrective work order regime. We can continue stepping up enforcement, including by sending every litter bug for CWO. But this is not sustainable for the long term. Instead, we will work with three main stakeholder groups to build and sustain a clean Singapore. With premises owners to uphold high public health standards, with the environmental services industry to transform the sector, and with individuals to engender greater social responsibility to keep Singapore clean. First, working with premises. We will continue to promote the adoption of good hygiene practices with the SG Clean Quality Mark and WAVE certification course this year. We will implement the Environmental Sanitation or ES regime as planned. Under this premises, managers must meet new mandatory baseline ES standards and proactively clean their premises. For the initial phase, we target to cover more than 2,000 preschools, schools, youth and elder care facilities, hawker centres and coffee shops by the end of fiscal year 2021. The ES Technical Committee has completed a technical guide which sets out the national baseline ES guidelines like daily cleaning frequencies for high-touch surfaces and toilets and prescribed periodic cleaning for hard-to-reach areas. The guide can be customised to develop sector-specific ES standards, such as for elder care facilities, which will be ready from mid-2021. Training of over 2,000 environmental control training of over 2,000 environmental control coordinators (ECCs) appointed to assist premises managers in developing an ES program will start from this month. Eligible participants will receive up to 90% in cost fee subsidy. Clean public toilets are critical to public health. Even with mandatory baseline standards, ageing infrastructure at some hawker centres and coffee shop toilets remains an impediment to maintaining cleanliness. That is why we introduced the Toilet Improvement Programme, or TIP, which Mr Pritam Singh asked about. This is a one-off grant where we co-fund hawker centres and coffee shop operators to install better fittings and adopt productivity measures. Our priority is to make toilets easier to clean and maintain. That's why we mandated features like toilet pedestals with anti-stain technology and a Votex flushing system that saves water in the same spirit as our green, green plan. Cleaners will also be helped to work more efficiently. Feedback systems will allow more targeted cleaning. Similarly, ammonia detection systems will send alerts when cleaning is needed. Mr Singh suggested to pilot the TIP at, hawker center, at a hawker centre with heavy footfall. In fact, the mandatory components of the TIP have already been tested at NEA managed hawker centres. They were effective and practical. NEA has consulted and will continue to consult the town councils on the TIP. We will consider their suggestions, including to extend the implementation timeline of the TIP. Mr Singh asked why we provide additional subsidies to hawker centres which remove their smoking corners. Protecting patrons from secondhand smoke and providing patrons with clean toilets are both important public health priorities. All new hawker centres built after 2011 are smoke-free. We have been encouraging the remaining 27 centres with smoking corners to remove them. 
a higher TIP co-funding amount can help to accelerate the shift. Second, we will work with the environmental services industry to transform the sector, which has experienced increased demand in the current pandemic. With your permission, Chairman, may I display slides on the LCD screens? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Since we launched the Environmental Services Industry Transformation Map, or ESITM, in 2017, the industry has made great strides to transform itself. For instance, 800 Super has secured better contracts locally and successfully ventured overseas. It achieved this through digitalization and building capabilities, such as GPS fleet management systems. Now it offers integrated environmental solutions and boasts an integrated energy and resource recovery facility that powers industri industrial laundry services and animal feed processing. As suggested by Dr. Lim Wee Kiat, we will support the industry to future-proof their businesses beyond COVID-19. I will highlight some key areas. One, we will move away from headcount-based contracts. The government has taken the lead by requiring outcome-based contracting for our new cleaning contracts from May 2020. This ensures clear outcomes for service buyers and encourages cleaning companies to innovate and be more productive, which in turn creates better jobs and address manpower constraints. To date, more than 110 public and private sector organisations have adopted outcome-based contracting. NEA will roll out a refreshed outcome-based contracting guide for the cleaning industry this month, which will encourage better service delivery through technology adoption and process improvements. It includes an easier method to measure service outcomes and sample contract clauses to cater for contingencies such as COVID-19. Service buyers and cleaning companies can agree on deploying more resources to meet additional cleaning requirements based on the prices that cleaning companies have quoted upfront. This offers flexibility to adapt to changing requirements. Two, we have extended the Productivity Solutions Grant until September 2021 to support companies to adopt automation. Three, the progressive wage model will be extended to waste management workers. The tripartite cluster for waste management will develop job ladders, training requirements and wage benchmarks. We also have initiatives for the pest management sector, which Ms. Rachel Ong spoke about. We are encouraging premises and pest management companies to jointly pilot customised digital solutions through the Incubate programme. For example, NEA and Enterprise Singapore recently closed a joint grant call with Incubate partners to seek solutions for a digital platform that integrates cleaning, waste and pest data. We will also work with the sector to develop outcome-based contracting guidelines for pest management contracts targeted to be ready by end 2021. We will grow the talent pool of pest management professionals. NEA is working with IHLs and the industry to review advice, continuing education and training and pre-employment training courses, such as the joint ITE NEA certification courses for pest management. Less members have the wrong impression. Pest management goes beyond catching rats, killing cockroaches and controlling the mosquito population. It takes serious signs to deal with these pests and prevent their multiplication. The third prong in our strategy is to foster individual responsibility around public hygiene, as Mr Gan Tian Po mentioned. This involves behavioural change, which is very challenging, but it is the only sustainable way forward. Recently, I launched the Clean Tables campaign at hawker centres, coffee shops and food courts. As Ms Ong asked, we are adopting new ways to spread the word. It is an uphill task to get individuals to clear their tables. Old habits die hard, but it can be done. For example, at Bukit Merah Central Food Centre, the Hawkers Association customised trays with educational messages and worked with hawkers and table cleaners to encourage patrons to return trays. They have achieved an exemplary tray return rate of more than 70%. I urge other hawker centres to follow their lead. In the coming months, we will roll out the campaign at all hawker centres, coffee shops and food courts. NEA will install around 75 tray return racks at hawker centres on top of the 900 today. At coffee shops, 10% have tray return infrastructure and SFA will work with the remaining operators to implement localised solutions. 
NEA will monitor the campaign outcome and conduct another survey on public attitudes towards trade return. We will also consider if we need to move beyond education to some form of regulation, as some members of the public have suggested. I will now speak on sustaining hawker culture. Restrictions on dine-in during the circuit baker period undoubtedly affected some hawkers, but they continued to work tirelessly to supply Singaporeans with affordable food. Many pivoted to food delivery services. To support our frontline hawker heroes, we provided five months of rental waivers and subsidies for table cleaning and centralised dish washing services. More than $50 million in waivers and subsidies was provided to over 13,000 hawkers. Over 1,300 hawkers have also taken up the $500 grant to adopt food delivery services. Under IMDA's Hawker Go Digital program, over 5,000 hawkers received an e-payment bonus up to $1,500 each. Despite the challenges, 2020 ended on a bright note. Hawker culture was successfully inscribed on the UNESCO list. This is a proud moment for Singapore. I will speak on two areas, supporting hawkers and future-proving hawker centres. Both are essential parts of our hawker culture. First, supporting our hawkers and sustaining the trade. There is no hawker culture without hawkers. Our hawkers' average age is about 60 years old. We does need to act urgently, as Mr. Louis Ng and as Mr. Leong Man Wai said, to ensure that future generations can continue to enjoy our hawker culture. Life as a hawker is not easy. I've spoken to many new hawker premiers. Some do it for passion, some with ambition to eventually expand ad and others to continue family legacies. For example, Mr. Fabian Tan of Skirt and Dirt at Chong Baru Market, a 32-year-old culinary school graduate and former senior sous chef, joined the hawker trade through the NEA's incubation store program. Fabian's goal is to eventually open his own cafe or restaurant. To aspiring hawkers, we will continue to do what we can to help you start on a good footing. Last year, the workshop on sustaining the hawker trade made recommendations which we accepted. Implementation is underway. First, we introduced the Hawkers Development Programme to equip aspiring hawkers with the skills to run a successful business. The programme comprises classroom training, apprenticeship with veteran hawkers, and an incubation stage with mentorship support and training allowance. I thank the veteran hawkers who have stepped forward as mentors. One example is work group member Miss Sandy Tan Pui Pui, who owns Kui Ho Chia at Block 6 Tanjong Paga Plaza. Second, we enhanced the incubation store program. In 2019, we extended the rental rebates to a total of 15 months. We are also increasing the number of incubation stores. Third, we introduced the Hawkers Succession Scheme. As Mr. Gunn highlighted, a critical factor in sustaining the trade is the transmission of culinary skills across generations. This scheme will also facilitate the transfer of hawker stalls and recipes by matching veteran hawkers to aspiring successors. Mr. Leong suggested that we focus on preserving hawker recipes. These schemes go beyond that to ensure that the recipes live on so that we can continue to sever the delicious food. We will convene an independent advisory panel comprising members of the hawker community to help engage potential veteran hawkers and assess the successor's readiness to take over. Mr. Muhammad Faisal Abdumana asked about reviving the hardship scheme. As he noted, we discontinued this in, the 19, in 1990 as job opportunities had increased, even for the unskilled. The scheme also had limited effectiveness with low take-up rate as most hardship cases preferred to wait for a vacant store in more popular centres. Today, we have many schemes to help the needy upskill and find good jobs while providing financial assistance and other support. More importantly, subsidising rentals alone will not guarantee success. Rentals are not the biggest cost for our hawkers. It is raw materials and manpower costs that make up about three quarters of hawkers' operating costs based on NEA survey of our hawker centres. Sustaining a hawker store requires entrepreneurship and passion, no different from any business. Nonetheless, we do want to support the needy who are genuinely passionate to enter the trade. We now have schemes which are open to all, including ex-offenders. Our Hawkers Development Programme and Incubation Store Programme offer aspiring hawkers subsidised skill training, training allowances, rental subsidies 
and a fitted out store, including at hawker centres run by socially conscious enterprises or SEHCs, to let them test their metal at lower and at a lower startup cost. They can also bid for a stall to NEA's monthly tender exercise, where no minimum bids are required. As a result, the median rental of food stalls in hawker centres today, including SEHCs, is much lower than the rentals in coffee shops or food courts. This is part of our effort to keep operating costs low and reduce the barrier of entry for new hawkers. Coupled with the earlier mentioned schemes, we hope this improves the viability of the trade to attract a new generation of hawkers. I will now speak on hawker centres, an important component of our hawker culture. Mr Leong said hawker centres have been declining in popularity. This is not true. An NEA survey found that close to 80% of Singaporeans patronise hawker centres at least once a week. Hence, it is opportune to consider how we can future-proof our hawker centres, as Ms Nadia Ahmad Samdin suggested. During the recent SG Hawker Fest, more than 7,700 participants shared what infrastructure and features they hope to see in future hawker centres. We received many suggestions from improving ventilation to providing live updates on crop levels at hawker centres. Building on the suggestions gathered, we will develop a hawker centre transformation programme or HDP over the next few years with our stakeholders. The HDP will incorporate lessons from COVID-19 and sustain our hawker culture. The programme will focus on ensuring a clean and safe environment at hawker centres. For example, aisles and tables will be better spaced to minimise crowding. We will create a more conducive environment for patrons, hawkers and cleaners. We will also enhance the use of technology and support digitalisation efforts. For example, we will work towards deploying sensors for crowd monitoring and to facilitate maintenance. Sustainability will also be a priority as part of our effort to bring sustainability to the community under GreenGov.sg. The new Senja Hawker Centre will have features like food waste digestion, rainwater harvesting and solar panels. We will progressively implement the HTP at new hawker centres and centres which undergo redevelopment. We will also conduct engagements with stakeholders at a few existing hawker centres to co-create centre-level solutions for these centres to address infrastructure gaps based on COVID-19 lessons. We hope to learn from these test centres and continue to refine the HDP. Chairman in Mandarin, please. Our hawker centres are an important component of our hawker centre. During the recent SG Hawker Fest, we received many suggestions on the infrastructure and features that the public hope to see in hawker centres of the future. We will use these suggestions as a foundation to develop a hawker centres transformation programme over the next few years. This programme will incorporate lessons from COVID-19 and sustain our thriving hawker culture to be sustained from generations to generations. The HTP will focus on ensuring a clean and safe environment at our hawker centres and enhancing them as community dining rooms. For example, ours and tables will be better space to minimize crowding. We will enhance the use of technology and support digitalization efforts, including sensors for crowd monitoring and to facilitate maintenance. Under this HTB, we will be bringing sustainability to the community including the planning and design of hawker centres. And this is to uh, resolve uh, some of the problems that we encountered during the COVID. Our Bukit Canberra Hawker Centre and Fernvale Hawker Centre and Market was delayed by COVID-19. However, we have made good progress since and they are estimated to open in fourth quarter 2021. Senja Hawker Centre is also scheduled to open early next year. To Mr Gan and Ms Ong's questions, we will appoint socially conscious enterprises to manage all new hawker centres. 
the SEHC model has allowed hawkers in these centres to better compete in a tough F&B landscape. SEHC operators curate the food options and organise events to attract more food for. We will continue to work closely with hawkers, operators and other stakeholders to refine the model. As is our MSE tradition, I have arranged to serve skirt and dirt sliders and kui ho tiat, square. Ming Chiang Kui from Manchi, uh, Manchi Delights and Epo Epo from Khao Sum Kui Mui Curry Puff, both at Yishun Park Hawker Centre, are also backed by popular demand. Also in the same tradition, let me also share a zero waste tip with members. Today, I'm wearing a necklace fashioned from old t-shirts, turning it, to, it into new cloth, just like new water, new sand, new oil and new feet. Chairman, in conclusion, the past year has focused our attention on the importance of sustaining a livable and enduring home, cleanliness and hygiene as our first line of defence, and safeguarding our hawker culture. My ministry will continue to work hard on these fronts. But to succeed, we need everyone's support. Thank you.